Okay. Uh, what's up, everybody? Good morning. Welcome to a Tuesday edition of Morning Scone presented by Brock, the Baton Rouge Orthopedic Clinic. Hudco Roofing, hudcoroofing.com. Uh, of course, you need a roof. Give us a shout. 364-1007. Uh, restored Motions, restoredmotions.com. And Procharge EV, prochargeev.com. Okay, y'all. Um, disappointing. But uh, the LSU women's basketball season ends in the Elite Eight. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about the game a bit, uh, what that means for um, program. You know, is Angel Reese, is her career at LSU over? Um, Haley Van Lith certainly could come back for another year. Will she? We'll delve into all of that. And uh, the baseball Tigers lose to Southern. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, 12 to 7. Uh, in look, I'd say it all the time it's baseball and things can happen in baseball. Uh, 12 to 7. Um, Southern, nah, fam. Uh, that's a problem. We'll delve into it. Uh, I had both streams going last night, and the Pels lost too. I, in, um, I'm not big into hyperbole. I don't like doing the whole, is this the worst day in the history of ever? Whatever. Um, and there have been plenty of like football weekends, right, where both LSU and the Saints lose, something like that. But on a given day where the LSU women lose to Iowa in a massive game, right, uh, not only Elite Eight, but the rematch and all the, for all the reasons we've talked about, the women lose to Iowa, the baseball team – Loses the Southern twelve to seven. I think that's the th third time ever that LSU's lost to Southern in baseball. Um, and and then the Pelicans get absolutely run by the Suns on their home floor last night. So not a great um, not a great night all the way around. Let's see if I can find this. Um, I well, should have looked this up before we started. Um, here you go. Series history. Yeah, LSU leads the all-time series 59-3, so it's only the fourth time ever that Southern has beaten LSU. Mm. LSU beat them 18-4 last year. Yikes. What you got, Jay? Let's see it. Anyway, okay. So uh, the women lose in the Elite Eight to Iowa. Um Tigers got up to a lead, and then uh, Iowa stormed back. If you were watching the game, Tigers flage beautiful move uh, in the lane to tie it up at half. So, so you're tied at 45 at half, and then the third quarter is what uh, is what swung the balance. Um, LSU outscored Iowa 31-26 in the first. Uh, Iowa uh, made up that deficit, went to half tied. But the third quarter, when Iowa outscored LSU twenty-four to thirteen in the third quarter, that did it. And yes, it was it was Iowa scoring, um, but that was actually their second lowest point total in a quarter. They scored twenty-six in the first, twenty-five in the fourth, and twenty-four in the third. Just nineteen in the second, but that's when the game really started to slow a bit. But um, uh, it wasn't that Iowa was just going nuts scoring; it was that LSU couldn't throw it in the ocean uh, in that third quarter. And it was it was so disappointing too because it wasn't like they were settling for bad shots, but. A lot of point blank misses, layups, you know, offensive rebound putbacks. That that's the disappointing part. Um, you know, LSU out rebounded Iowa fifty four to thirty six. Fifty four to thirty six on the offensive glass. LSU out rebounded them twenty three to six. Um, stunning, stunning that LSU is that dominant on the offensive glass and lost the game. But here's your story. Iowa was 46% from the floor. LSU was 38% from the floor. That's the difference in the game. Um, free throws, you know, Iowa went to the line more, but so much of that was just at the end of the game when LSU was fouling. Uh, LSU was 11 of 17 from the free throw line. Iowa 17 of 22, but like we mentioned, a lot of that was late in the game when LSU was fouling and trying to stay in it. But um, but that was the point. In the third quarter, LSU couldn't throw it in the ocean. Iowa built their lead, and it was just too much for LSU to overcome in the fourth. And then you had a shot um, – when Angel Reese fouled out with with under four minutes to play, it was a ten point game. Reese goes to the goal. Um, she makes the shot. Looks like she's going to get an and one. They call a charge. So that 
that knocked Reese out of the game. She fouled out of the game right there. But if she gets that and one and makes it, it's seven with under four to play, and it's doable. I mean, you're two stops away, you know. So um disappointing for sure. But all in all, man, you know, you're not gonna win the national championship every year. I think we all know that. Um, but you know, what this year proved was, you know, this was a team that uh, is a program that Kim Mulkey has built that you can expect deep runs in March or April now. Um, annually, it should be the expectation. And, uh, you know, we'll see what this means for this program with, uh, you know, with these players who elects to come back. It's odd to think um, that women's basketball players would leave early for the WNBA when the WN, when you can make money on NIL and the WNBA salaries are um, are capped and you know you're none of the WNBA players are going to make seven figures um so if you're Angel Reese do you stay at LSU where quite I if we're being very honest your star shines brighter and you're on more of a stage in the in the college game than you are in the WNBA. Now the flip and you have an NIL. The flip side of that is you have to go to school. And not everybody wants to go to school. So if you can not have to go to class and be sort of tethered to that schedule and you can just be a basketball player and an influencer, that's going to be appealing to a lot of people. So she can still go make all of her endorsement money and get and get a salary from a WNBA team. So there's a couple of ways to look at it, you know, but uh, Reese could come back. Um, uh, you know, Haley Van Lith, um, I think Haley could take advantage of the COVID year. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think she could come back for another year. She's a senior, but I think she could take advantage of the COVID year, if I'm not mistaken. But that's another one that you know, would likely go. You know, but, um, you know, Anissa Moro is a junior who could certainly come back for another year. You'll get Samaya Smith coming off an of injury. You'll get Michaela Williams coming back as a sophomore. You know, Poe is a junior, so she's back for another year. Uh, Flaugé is just a sophomore as well, so she's back for another year. So, um, you know, you should have a, a really nice core of this team returning. You know, Del Rosario, who played a, a nice role this year backing up Angel Reese um, at, just as a freshman. Yeah. And then, you know, Kim Mulkey's going to go hit the portal again, like like she always does. So we got, you already got um, the the forward from Arkansas who's committed. So, or signed, I should say, not committed, she signed. So a lot of reason to look forward as well. So, all right, we'll say some good mornings here. I'll get into the baseball game as well uh, as we go through it. So let's say some good morning, see what y'all got as always. Uh, Samuel Smith, good morning. Pelicans headed to the play and is going to hurt my soul. You know, Samuel, here's the thing I'll say about the Pels. I, I don't know that I'm ready to go there yet because you still got uh, nine games to play, nine or eight. Um, and look, and, and it's it's tough, but you get a, a winnable game at home Orlando against Orlando on Wednesday. Tomorrow, I'll be there for that, actually. Um, let's see. You've got, let's see, Orlando, one, two, three. You have seven left, my bad, my bad. So seven to play. It's Orlando, San Antonio, both winnable. At Phoenix, uh, at Portland, should win. So it's, you should go three and one there. At Sacramento, we'll see. At Golden State, we'll see. Home against the Lakers. You know, what's it going to take? Could you get five of your last seven? If you get five of your last seven, I think you avoid the play-in. Um, but I'm with you, man. That's the thing that – as that. If you're the Pelicans, that's what you're fighting for. We talked about yesterday in AFR, which is, you know, we're looking at it through a Pelicans lens in terms of, yeah, uh, you would love to get home court in the first round. And the Clippers in the four are very much within reach. You're After the loss last night, you're now two and a half games behind the Clippers. But you're just a game ahead of Phoenix for the sixth spot. And Phoenix just beat you. And you play them again in Phoenix. So you got work to do and probably need some help. By the way, you're only a game and a half ahead of Sacramento, who's in the eight. So not only are you a breath away from being in the play-in, but also playing in the 9-10 matchup, you're playing for the um, – or in one of the 9 or nine or 10 uh, uh, spots where you're going to have to win two games. So anyway, yeah, it's – after eight, after 82 games or after 75 games, still a lot on the line with seven to play. 
PTG Toasty, what's up? Trey Fisher, good morning. Kirk Taylor, Kelly Gross, James McKinney, Tommy Primo, good morning, y'all. Do me a favor if you're there on YouTube, smash that like button. Uh, subscribe up to the channel, Facebook, like the Matt Moscona page, share the post. Hey, Bill, good morning. Kirk, LSU baseball. I know midweek games don't matter, but four-game losing skid, five of the last seven. Kirk, when I I I have to I have to clarify this. Okay, I know I have to clarify it all the time. The result of a midweek game doesn't matter. Okay. Meaning, because you lost to Southern, that's not going to keep you from whatever goal you have. That's always been my point about midweek games. Okay. Like if you go 20 and 10 in conference play, but you lose a midweek game or or all of your mid go 20 and 10 in the SEC, but lose every one of your midweek games, you're still a national seed by virtue of going 20 and 10 in the toughest conference in America. That's my point. Losing to Southern and getting no hit through when did LSU get their first hit of the game last night? Uh I mean, you only finish the game with would you have five hits last night? Uh four hits. Now you scored seven runs and four hits because it's Southern and they walk a lot of guys and hit a lot of guys. Um, LSU drew 11 walks last night and left 12 on base. Or, you know, Mac Bingham 0 for 4 in the leadoff spot. Tommy White went two for three in the two hole. Larson Larson got the start. 0 for three with two Ks was hit by a pitch. Travinsky skid continues over three with two strikeouts. I'm sorry, one strikeout. He walked twice. Brady Neal walked three times. Mm-mm-mm. Anyway, whatever. The bigger problem, obviously, four hits against Southern, but you also gave up 12 runs. You started Kate Anderson, and I think you start to wonder, like, did you wreck Kate Anderson's confidence? I mean, he was so good in the pre-conference. You put him on the weekend and the last two times on the weekend, it didn't go well. And now you move him back to the midweek and he gives up the three run bomb. Now he did strike out six in fairness. He, 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 he pitched two innings and struck out six. So, but he walked two and gave up the three run bomb. <sighs> and then after that, Dutton went two and a third, uh, little didn't get an out. Lore two thirds of an inning. He get, did he give up the three run homer as well? It, it's running together. You used Buckham, Helmers, Hurd, Moffitt. Uh, Hurd gave up three runs at whatever. Um, <laughs> PTG toast. He had to go and say we haven't lost a midweek. Can't say that no more. Trivia Carter, Kirk Taylor. Let's see. Uh, Brian Turner, Wendell Norman, uh, Bubba Tatum. Good morning. Rough night for the ladies. Sloppy defense. Too many wasted quality offensive opportunities. Baseball expletive. Enough said. Uh, Timothy Fontenot. Travel adventures with Eric B. Bad for the Tigers. Great for the Jags. Yeah, and that's the other, the other side of it. It's a. I mean, in the history of that program, it's only the fourth time they've ever beaten LSU. So congrats to Southern. I mean, it went out there and walked 11, 11 uh, batters, but uh, put up 12 runs. Couple of long bombs and yeah, uh, well, I'll I look at um, look at this weekend with Vandy and really feel like this is your pendulum weekend. Um, I 
uh, I've talked about, I need to give this some more thought, but we've talked about how, you know, mathematically, if they could get to the halfway point of league play at five and 10 or six and nine, um, you're still very much in the mix. Um, in the mix for the postseason, potentially to host a regional, obviously not national seed. You can you can all but kiss a national seed goodbye. I mean, you would have to go on a 2008 like run where you sweep, you know, the last four weekends of conference play or something like that. Um, which I, I mean, although the schedule lightens up, that also just doesn't feel realistic, uh, especially with the way this team is playing right now. Um, But it feels like this weekend really is your pendulum weekend because you've lost all three series. You're coming off a terrible loss to Southern. It's like, okay, how do you bounce back? You got swept at Arkansas, and instead of bouncing back and being angry about it and focusing and locking in, you laid down and you got punked by, by Southern. And you lose 12-7, to 7, only the fourth time in the history of the program you lost to Southern. Um, and... So now you go into this weekend against Vanderbilt, and it's a Vanderbilt team that's similar to Arkansas in that they got a really good rotation. They don't hit the ball exceptionally well. Uh, Vandy's last in the SEC in, in team batting average. So you got a really good offense, excuse me, a really good pitching staff, bad offense. You're at home. This is a Vanderbilt team that's been a tail two weekends. Two weekends ago, they got swept at South Carolina. This weekend, Vanderbilt swept Missouri. Now, Missouri is the worst team in the conference, but still. Um, if you lose another series, this time at home, and then next week you have to go to Tennessee, that's where you could kind of say, all right, I think the wheels have, have fallen off. And now it's like you just got to find a way to get in the postseason. Um, not great. Got to find something. Got to find a spark somewhere. Uh, okay. Brandon Ray, what's going on? Russell Jory, good morning from Raleigh. I don't know if South Carolina could have beaten Iowa last night. Um, I mean, sure they could have. It was a tie ball game at half, and it was really just the third quarter that was LSU's undoing. If you're surprised by South Carolina's offense, you shouldn't be. Or excuse me, about Iowa's offense, you shouldn't be because that's what they do every game. They average 91. I mean, that's that's what they do every game. So you just you have to match them. You're not going to limit them. you got to match them. And LSU did a great job of that until the third quarter when they couldn't throw it in the ocean. Brett Gidry, regardless of the national narrative surrounding the women's basketball team, they showed class post game. They've always shown class. I, I think they're a they've been a, good, a really good group to cover. Um, it's um, it's interesting how those things get built off of individual moments, like Angel Reese doing "You Can't See Me." That's all anybody knows. Um, so you focus on that, and people magnify that and create a narrative. I think Angel's been great. Um, even though like a lot of you don't even know this, but like, you know, she's her NIL deals, like her NIL deal with Mercedes. Um, she's got a Mercedes Benz of Baton Rouge. They didn't give her a car. Um, like she pays a note on that car because she wanted to have that responsibility and all that sort of stuff. Like she's, she's a good, like young woman who's handled tremendous scrutiny and, uh, and attention. Uh, I think with a lot of class and grace, I think she's been great. Um, Skip and Smoke lost to Southern. I think Paul did as well. John Hendricks. Let's see. It's all right, everyone. We have softball still. Christian, great game and effort from women's basketball. Clark and Van Lith. But Clark had Van Lith on skates all night. Tough to watch from a defensive standpoint. Christian, again, that's literally everyone that, pay, that plays Caitlin Clark. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I get it. Most people don't. And I, I'm I'm not telling you I do. I'm not telling you I lock in, but like I'm not watching Iowa women's basketball all year, but like that's what she does. She gets the slightest bit of separation and, and then it's bombs away. It's it's a lot like 
Steph Curry. It's an approach like Steph Curry takes. I'm not saying she's Steph Curry. Don't misunderstand me. Don't get it crossways. I'm just saying it's like her range is anywhere. Like she could pull up from anywhere. So if she gets any space, she's going to pull up and she makes some crazy threes. So, you know, the difference last night from last year was her ability to distribute and get her teammates involved. Um, Caitlin Clark last night. Uh, let's see. She's, uh, when did she, she, uh, she scored 41 and had 12 assists. I mean, that's, that's the difference from a year ago is the 12 assists. Uh, I mean, she was nine of 20 from three. So she was, she was less than 50% from three. She was 13 of 29 from the floor. I'm not telling you it's bad. I mean, nine of 20, you're what, 45 ish percent there? Um, yeah, 45%. So that's very good. But when you're putting up 20 shots and you miss 11, that's 11 empty possessions, right? But when you make nine of them, that's a trade off and you assist on 12 baskets. That's just what she is. Um, Tommy, uh, Twitter is a nasty, nasty place this morning. A lot of vile creatures showing us who they really are. Um, that's why it's important, Tommy, to just regulate your feed. Like, don't go to the For You page on Twitter. Just go to the following page and regulate who you follow. And if people are dumb, mute them. And it'll be uh, interesting how you craft your feed. Tim Gotro, good morning. Let's see, John, glad we made it to the Elite Eight. Matt Plavidal, good morning. Uh, does LSU miss Wes Johnson more than we think? Matt, I think there's there's something to that, man. Um, I mean, Skip Bertman did call Wes Johnson the best pitching coach he's ever seen. And then on top of that, remember, not only is it Wes Johnson, but it's the third pitching coach in as many years. You went from Jason Kelly to Wes Johnson, now to Nate Yeski. So you've got three different pitching coaches with three different styles, three different approaches, uh, three different ways of calling the game and sequencing pitches. Remember, like, one of the things we talked about early in the year, and it's not like this is an original thought from me, but you know, if you ever look behind home plate and you see the the guys, the radar guns, all the scouts that sit back there, you know, I know some of those people and talk to them, and they'll tell you like the biggest difference early this year was Yeski was throwing a lot of fastball sliders, a lot of straight pitches. You didn't see a lot of a lot of breaking balls, and part of I think that was the part with Hurd why he struggled early. And then Hurd started working in his over-the-top breaking ball, and I think that's when Hurd started to settle in a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I do think – I don't know if it's necessarily just that – just, you know, Wes Johnson's absence, but a lot of the turnover, that's pretty natural when you have you know, three pitching coaches in three years. I think if you had three offensive coordinators in three years or three defensive coordinators in three years. It's tough, man. David Tolson, uh, Caitlin Clark got some and then some, trying to dig out of a turnover hole, dismal shooting. Uh, and the third did them in. Uh, Tiger Diver, good morning. Larry Garner, Rick Manuel, Clay, Caitlin Clark was unreal. Angel was great, overshadowed by Clark. Um, the thing about Angel is, uh, well, of, of course she got overshadowed because they lost the game. But Reese had 17 re, uh, points and 20 rebounds. 20 on a bum ankle, too, by the way. Um, and you know, you wonder but for the ankle injury when it happened, when LSU had a lead. And look, she came back in the game quickly, but how much did that affect things? Do you go into half with a lead? I don't know. Um, Samuel Smith. No one has talked about pitch calling. Do you think that could be an issue or just strictly execution? Just talked about it, Samuel. Uh, Kurt, let's see, Craig Duga. After yesterday at Martin Parish Schools need to be closed. Uh, Jesus Gutierrez, they choked. How terrible did our players play? I, are you talking about the women's basketball team or or baseball team against Southern? Um, Craig Duga, closely guarded, unguarded, didn't matter. Clark had ice in her veins. Could have hit shots from half court, it seemed. She did, but she also missed 11 of them. 11 threes. Uh, she missed 16 shots in total. She was 13 of 29. She had 16 empty. She missed more shots than she made. She had 16 empty possessions. She scored 41. 
Now, six of them came from the free throw line, but she's great. Like you understand the way that the way that they play, Caitlin Clark is going to score. She's a phenomenal shooter. Her range is anywhere. She's going to put up shots. She's going to score. So, like, I can live with Caitlin Clark getting 41. The problem is when Martin scores 21. You know, she average she averages 10 and scored 21 last night. I'm sorry, she averaged 13. Kate Martin averaged 13 a game. She scored, she scored 21. Like that's that's your problem. You know, you can you can handle Clark getting 41. You can't handle Martin scoring 21. Um the other one was uh Sydney Affalter. Um she averages eight a game, scored 16 last night. Like that's the problem is you let the role, like I can handle Caitlin Clark in 41. You can't let Martin get 21 and Affolter get 16. You can't let them double their season point total averages. Like that's where you lost the game. Not Caitlin Clark's great, but that's how Iowa plays. Like she's going to get hers. It's like if you, it's like if you play, um, tech, you know, Texas Tech with Mike Leach in football, they're like, who you pick pick an offense that spreads it out and throws it a ton like you're gonna give up passing yards because that's what they do but if you know they they don't run the ball and you're good in the red zone you can limit them to, to field goals you get turnovers whatever i mean that's the key like but you realize like they're gonna get passing yards same thing like caitlin clark is gonna score like you don't just look at that and go caitlin clark scored 41 that was the difference that wasn't the difference the difference was the other girls who couldn't miss all right, smash the like button if you would. Uh, subscribe up to the channel. Facebook, like the Matt Moscona page, share the posts. Thanks for being there as always, y'all. Uh, as always, brought to you by Brock, the Baton Rouge Orthopedic Clinic. If you need an orthopedist, they're the best. Locations all over the greater Baton Rouge area, uh, including Tangipo. So if you're there uh, in Hammond, I should say. So if you're in Tangipo Parish uh, and you need an orthopedist, go to Brock. They're the best. Uh, it's good enough for the Saints, good enough for LSU, good enough for me, good enough for you. It's Brock, the Baton Rouge Orthopedic Clinic. Of course, uh, if you need a roof, give a shout. 364-1007. Really, really, really close to being able to unveil a uh, new logo name, branding, all that sort of stuff, and I'm excited about it. Really, really close. But in the meantime, call us, 364-1007. 364-1007. Um, let's see. Do a couple more minutes here. Wow. Let me go to the bottom. Um. Jeff McKithen, what's going on? Apollo Balboa, midweek games don't count. Justin Holman, I don't know what that is. Rhoda Ewell seems like it's a pile of two strike, two out hits this year. Rhoda, they like, first of all, it's the same thing we've talked about over and over. You only got four hits in the game last night. You um you have been unable to get any production out of the leadoff spot. When remember, last year Dylan Cruz was your leadoff hitter and he had 500 much of the season. So you always had guys on base for your run producers. And on top of that, you have way too much swing and miss. There's just way too many strikeouts on this team. Like Jay has filled the lineup, which I, I'm not blaming him for doing it, but he's filled the lineup with guys that are boppers that, that can go yard. But as a result, you're going to have a lot of swing and miss. You struck out nine times last night. You struck out nine times last night against Southern. Like you don't have enough contact hitters in the lineup. Um, Larson got the start. He struck out twice. Uh, Jared Jones struck out. Travinsky struck out. Milam, Napolt, Pearson, Malazzo, Brown in a pinch hit roll struck out. I mean, and it ain't like it's just one guy. It's you had nine strikeouts and eight different batters struck out last night. Um, okay. Edward Cooper, what's up? Leon Williams, maybe Southern was the wake up call. Good job for Southern. Great win for Southern. Absolutely. JR, this is an anomaly. Women's college basketball fall back to earth next year. Maybe JR. I mean, I think any sport has, you know, can be can be catapulted by star power. Um uh, and Caitlin Clark has no doubt been been a lightning rod, but you know, I think in the same way that college basketball had its magic bird moment back in 79. Uh, and it really, you know,
propelled the sport forward. Uh, I think the same can be true for women's basketball. Um, I think parity helps as well. When UConn isn't winning every single year, um, and there are more teams that feel like they have a shot when you get some new blood in there, I think that that's a good thing. Um, I mean, the the blue bloods are great. Like in in the men's Final Four, the, the a couple of years ago, we had North Carolina, Duke, Kansas, Villanova. I mean, that's a TV network's dream to have all the blue bloods. You know, in last year when you had Florida Atlantic, I mean, Houston. I mean, nobody was. It's not engaging to bring the casual fan in, but sometimes you have star power like this that can hook people on sport, make teams invest more. It's almost like what LSU baseball did in the '90s. Skip proved the model that you can make money and 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 bring fans in and have engagement in college baseball. So programs start investing more, and as a result, you've got a much better product of college baseball right now. So the same can be true for women's basketball. Um. Uh, Deborah Cowart, what's going on? Uh, I got to go, y'all. It's 802. Any more, any more, any more. All right. If I missed you, my apologies. I'm going really quickly to try to get, yeah, I got to go, got to go, got to go. Okay. My apologies if I missed you. Uh, hey, Dad, good morning. I always got to say, say good morning to my pops. Quentin Brake, Bill, good morning to you as well. Bubba Smith, Jerry DeLucky, what's good, man? Uh, good morning, Uncle Scone. Rough night for the local teams. It was a bad night. Uh, there's no doubt. LSU women's basketball season ends. The baseball team um, loses the Southern. The Pels got run on their home floor by by the Suns. So, yeah, better days ahead. Let's hope this one's a better one. Um, all right, y'all have an awesome day. Thanks so much for watching. Um, we'll catch you for AFR at 3. Peace.